Hello, I'm Tony Ward from Northumbria University. Um, I'm Professor of Law at Northumbria. Um, I teach law and literature, but my my special legal subject is the law of evidence. So, at least in part, this talk is looking at Mary Frank, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from the perspective of evidence law, and I think that. In all the vast literature on Frankenstein, no one has thought of looking at it from the perspective of the law of evidence before. Um, but um, I, I also think that looking at particularly the account Mary Shelley gives of the trial of Justine Moritz um, sheds light on a question that might be of uh, wider interest to literary scholars, which is the relationship between Frankenstein and the events surrounding the French Revolution, which was taking place at roughly the time the story is set. Um, the picture there um, would serve quite well as an illustration of Justine Moritz, the unfortunate servant girl um, wrongly convicted of murder and executed in Geneva. Um, it is in fact um, a picture of a different servant girl who was the victim of a, almost certainly a miscarriage of justice in London in 1815. That's um, in Liza Fenning. Um, so it's plausible, I think, that at least in part, that particular trial and the wider debate around circumstantial evidence that was going on, at least indirectly, influenced the novel. And that's one of the things I'll try to argue. Um, but first, for those of you who may not be very familiar with the events in the novel, here's a brief summary of the Justine Moritz um, story. So Justine is a servant with the Frankenstein family, uh, an elite family in the city state of Geneva, and, and she's a much loved um, member of the household, and particularly much loved by Elizabeth Lavenza, who is the cousin of Victor Frankenstein, um, his fiance. Um, probably we all know what's going to happen to her in the end. Um, Justine is a Catholic, um, which might seem slightly improbable in um, Geneva, one of the strongholds of Protestantism, but she comes to one of the outlying villages, and in fact, in the late 18th century, Catholicism was tolerated in some of those outlying villages, so it's not implausible that she could be a Catholic. Um, and she is convicted of the murder of Victor Frankenstein's little brother, William. Um, William, sorry, Victor, um, comes to the conclusion, based on very little evidence, um, just the fact that he glimpses the creature um, somewhere near Geneva, that the creature is in fact the killer of William. And in fact he's right, but he keeps silent about this, he thinks no one will believe him, um, Justine is convicted and she is then persuaded by her Catholic priest to confess to the murder um, and she is executed. Now the other, the background to this um, story is I would argue, the, the impending threat of revolution. 
of which the characters are blithely unaware. Now, Frankenstein has often been interpreted as an allegory of the French Revolution. Um, Lee Sterenberg, Ronald Paulson, Anne Meller, a book on Mary Shelley have all argued this. Um, the idea of the the revolution as a monster um, was common in counter-revolutionary counter propaganda at the time. Um, it seems significant that Frankenstein builds the creature in Ingolstadt because Ingolstadt was the original home of the Illuminati, uh, the Enlightenment civil society that um, was blamed um, by some people for causing the French Revolution by their, their sinister plots. Um, and uh, Percy Shelley, for a time, um, greatly admired the Illuminati. He thought the Illuminati were the good guys. He, he even wrote a, a, a novel, unfinished novel, celebrating the Illuminati. Um, I think his views changed by the time Frankenstein was written. Um, now, Anne Meller reckons that the murder of William Frankenstein coincides in time with the height of the, the terror in France, uh, 1794, and, and several um, scholars who have attempted to date the events of Frankenstein reckon it takes place in 1794 or 1795. Um, however, this just cannot be right. Um, it's quite clear, also I shall argue, that the trial of Justine Moritz takes place in pre-revolutionary Geneva, and pre-revolutionary in Geneva means before 1792. Um, and we're given an important clue to the date because we, we, we know that the murder of William Frankenstein takes place on Thursday, May the 7th. Um, and if Mary Shelley didn't just pick her dates at random, but as some scholars think, use the actual calendar, well, Thursday, May the 7th, that could be 1795, but it could also be May the 7th, 1789. And I would suggest that that is the correct date, just before the French Revolution. Um, events are moving towards the revolution at that point. Um, the, the fact that this is pre-revolutionary Geneva is really made a pretty obvious by, by Mary Shelley. Um, she, she stresses the fact that the Frankensteins are a long established um, members of the the ruling elite of Geneva. Now, now Mary Shelley of course conceived the story when staying near Geneva. She visited Geneva, she'd written about Geneva as we'll see. She was not totally unaware of, of the nature of Geneva um, and she she situates the Frankenstein family among the sort of ruling oligarchy of the Genovese Republic. Um, so Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, right at the start of the, of the novel, um, says that his ancestors have for many years been councillors and syndics, that is, they've been among the chief magistrates of Geneva. Um, his father had filled several of these jobs, and what in fact provokes the monster to kill little William is his saying, hideous monster, let me go, my papa is a syndic, he is Monsieur Frankenstein. Um, so he, Frankenstein, Alphonse Frankenstein, this, this representative of the old order, is still in power, clearly, when, when William Frankenstein is murdered. 
and he tells elizabeth um dry your tears if she is as you believe innocent rely on the justice of our judges and the activity with which i shall prevent the slightest shadow of partiality um so he's clearly thinking here of his fellow magistrates not a trial by jury which strangely some commentators on the novel think is what um, Justine gets. Um, juries were in fact introduced into Geneva by the revolutionary regime. But it seems to me that Mary Shelley is giving a reasonably accurate um, account of a trial by the, the Council of 25. The, um, the, 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 the council of magistrates who, who, who largely ran Geneva and also heard serious criminal cases. Um, this wouldn't have been hard for her to find out about at the time, although I, I can't find any actual evidence that she looked up the relevant books. Um, but a very significant detail um, is where the murder takes place. Now, in the history of a six weeks tour, which Mary and Percy Shelley published the year before Frankenstein, um, describing their, their travels in um, Europe in the, the immediate aftermath of the defeat of Napoleon, um, So Mary writes about the, the Plain Palais, um, which is where now you will find this um, statue of Frankenstein's creature. Um, and she writes about how in 1794, the magistrates um, were taken to the Plain Palais and shot. And she writes that from respect to the memory of their predecessors, none of the present magistrates ever walk in the Plan Palais. Um, what are the Frankenstein family doing immediately before Victor's murder? Last Thursday, May the 7th, writes Alphonse Frankenstein, I, my niece and your two brothers went to walk in the Plan Palais. Um, so, surely this is a very clear indication that the murder of William is meant to foreshadow the revolutionary violence that is about to engulf Geneva, um, but of which the Frankensteins are completely oblivious. Um, there, there's no indication, I may, Mary may not have been aware of this, but there, 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 there's no indication of any awareness on their part of just how tense the political situation in Geneva was. Now, against this background then, um, the the trial of Justine Moritz is a trial based on circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence was a controversial subject at this time. Um, the exponents of circumstantial evidence argued that circumstances cannot lie. People lie, evidence doesn't. If that slogan sounds familiar, it's perhaps because of CSI, um, which has exactly the same take on things. Um, the circumstantial evidence that we rely on now is very often um, trace evidence detected by means of forensic science, but it's still circumstantial evidence. We still face great reliance on circumstantial evidence, 
these debates of the early 19th century are still quite topical. And without supposing for a moment that Mary Shelley had any great interest in the law of evidence, um, I think she would have been aware um, of the trial of Eliza Fenning, which I mentioned at the beginning, and, and Tim Marshall indeed has written an article on the Eliza Fenning case and its links to um, Mary Shelley and also Charles Dickens. Um, also in 1815, the, the barrister Samuel March Phillips um, published the theory of presumptive proof. Um, now, I don't again suggest that there's any direct influence here, but it just gives an indication of the debate that was going on in the background um, at the time when Mary Shelley was writing this about how far um, circumstantial evidence could be relied on. And one of the things Phillips did was to, to collect numerous cases in which circumstantial evidence had been misleading. Um, and one of these cases um, follows a similar pattern to the Justine Morris case. Um, uh, so the key piece of evidence against Justine is that a valuable miniature that William had been wearing is found in her pocket. Um, so that, that immediately provides an apparent motive for the murder that she stole this valuable miniature from him and killed William to presumably to silence him. Um, one of the cases that Phillips mentions is, is John Jennings, who was executed as a highwayman after a purse containing coins that it's all plenty have come for the robbery were found in his pocket. In fact, it was the defendant's employer who was the highwayman and had led the people investigating the robbery to find the evidence. Now, as I say, I don't think that Mary Shelley was an avid reader of books about the law of evidence, but one book she certainly did read and reread um, when she was working on Frankenstein is her father, William Godwin's book, Caleb Williams. Um, and Godwin certainly was interested in these um, debates about evidence. Um, and circumstantial evidence is absolutely crucial in Caleb Williams. Um, so two characters, the Hawkinses, uh, father and son, are hanged uh, for murder on the basis of circumstantial evidence. Um, Hawkins's blood stained clothes are left in the scene, um, and a knife handle is found in his house, which matches the murder weapon. The real killer is um, Falkland, the brilliant but flawed um, aristocrat um, whose servant Caleb Williams is. Um, um, Falkland keeps silent, he lets the innocent Hawkinses go to their deaths, and he is tormented by guilt about this, just as Victor Frankenstein is tormented by guilt over the death of Justine. Um, and when Falkland realises that Caleb Williams is onto him, he um, plants evidence on Caleb and has him imprisoned. Um, and uh, there are, in fact, other elements of circumstantial evidence in the novel that I'll go into in the written version of this. But there's lots of circumstantial evidence in Caleb Williams. Now, I think this is where Mary Shelley's interest in the subject comes from, um, not from the specialised legal literature. 
But if we if we look at Frankenstein as a whole, there are in fact three episodes which follow a pattern of circumstantial evidence corroborated or seemingly corroborated by a confession. So the first, of course, is Justine. There's circumstantial evidence. It's misleading, but it's pretty strong. Um, Justine admits she cannot explain how this picture found its way into her pocket. Um, but um, the fact that she's convicted is also clearly influenced by the, the background beliefs of her judges. Um, the judges find the idea of uh, an untrustworthy servant viciously bet betraying the family that's been so kind to her. They find that a, a, a plausible story um, and this background of distrust against servants, and perhaps particularly Roman Catholic servants, um, completely overwhelms the, the evidence of Justine's good character, which is given so passionately on Justine's behalf by Elizabeth Lavenza. Then, Parallel to this, there is Victor Frankenstein's conviction that the creature is the real killer. Um, he bases this surmise on almost no evidence. The only evidence he has is that he, he catches a glimpse of the creature uh, near Geneva. Um, but bringing to this his unfounded, um, and as we eventually learn, his completely false belief that, the, that he has created an innately evil monster, um, he jumps to the conclusion that the creature committed the murder. I think also he jumps to this conclusion because it fits with his guilt about having created this creature and let the creature loose on the world. He feels he's been punished in some way, which of course he is. I mean, he's right about that. Um, and eventually, of course, there is the great confrontation between Frankenstein and the creature. The creature tells his own story, which confirms that, yes, he did kill William, um, but also makes it clear that Frankenstein has completely misjudged the creature's initial character. The creature, of course, was innately good, as well as phenomenally intelligent, um, and has only become embittered as a result of his rejection by Frankenstein and by society. The, the third episode is when Frankenstein um, gets arrested in Ireland for the murder of his friend Clerval. Um, again, of course, it's the creature who's responsible. Um, Frankenstein is very conscious of the parallel between this and, and what happened to Justine, and he, he fatalistically accepts it as, um, you know, a kind of retribution for what happened to Justine. Um, so, in this case, we have, again, Misleading circumstantial evidence, Frankenstein's boat um, resembles the boat used by the, um, the actual killer, um, the creature. 
Um, so the villagers think that the same person has just returned to the beach. Um, we have a what sounds like a confession. Uh, when he sees Clerval's body, he, he blurts out in, in French, which unluckily for him, the magistrate understands, um, what, what sounds like a, a confession of, a, of guilt. And of course, what he's really guilty about is um, <laughs> that he sees this as another victim of the preacher. Um, plus the fact that, of course, um, Frank, apart from the fact that Frankenstein doesn't really try to defend himself, um, the, the story that um, it's sheer coincidence that his boat washes up on the same beach where the murdered body of his friend is lying is highly improbable. Now, um, this could just be clumsy plotting by Mary Shelley um, or the only other explanation I can think of is that there is some sort of um, supernatural connection between Frankenstein and the creature so that even though he thinks he's drifting aimlessly he is instinctively following the boat anyway it's very strange um, um, and uh, looks pretty damning for Frankenstein. Um, on the other hand, there's good character. He's a gentleman. Um, the magistrate goes to the trouble of contacting Frankenstein's father in Geneva. Um, and to be fair to Frankenstein, he has an alibi. But the magistrate only goes to the considerable lengths that he must go to, to to confirm this alibi because he's so convinced of Frankenstein's good character. So in fact, the sort of moral of these three stories taken together is that the, the good judge, Cohen, the magistrate, um, is is guided by his his sympathetic understanding of the character of the person he's dealing with um the magistrates who try justine um with what frankenstein calls cold unfeeling reason which is a bit rich coming from victor frankenstein but that's that's how he sees them, um, and and Frankenstein himself, in his judgment of the creature, um, they are men of reason, but without adequate human sympathy. And this is what leads them astray, um, and this. I think fits in with the, the the sort of overall moral message of the novel, which is about the importance of the the domestic affections, as Mary Shelley calls them. Um, that um, any political enterprise has to be kept in kept within the bounds of what's compatible with the domestic affections. Um, and I'll just end with the line that the title of the talk comes from. Um, after the trial of Justine Moritz, um, Elizabeth Levenza says to Victor, when falsehood can look so like the truth, who can assure themselves of certain happiness? I feel as if I were walking on the edge of a precipice towards which thousands are crowding and endeavouring to plunge me into the abyss. What does this refer to? Because thousands crowding towards a precipice doesn't sound like an obvious metaphor for um, the trial itself. Well, surely it's 
a metaphor for the impending revolution. Um, if, as I've argued, this is happening in May 1789, on the very brink of the precipice of the French Revolution, um, then when Elizabeth says, who can be certain of, who can assure themselves of certain happiness, um, she has some kind of premonition here that the the stable society which her family imagine themselves to be living in is in fact extremely fragile and is about to be swept away in the convulsions of revolutionary change, which is where I'll leave it.